Heavenly Father, thank you for a chance to sing your praises this morning. Lord, as we move into to going into full gear, pray that we would not only find our pace as we as we move and start to get involved with things again, but you would you would help us adjust if necessary as we go. We wouldn't be so prideful about our programs or our schedule, our things that we couldn't listen to you in the way. I thank you for for our regular solid body, the people who are here uh, week after week, and have, some of them have come back home after vacations, and it's great to see the family back. And Lord, thank you for all the other guests that we have, some that come um, now quite frequently that are that are kind of new members to our family. And we just thank you for those people as well. And Lord, as we open up your word, would you almost understand how every single part of it, even down to the specific words, can have an impact on the truth and the way we need to think about you and who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. We are nearly to the end of the story. We've got a few more weeks after this. Uh, for those of you who, do, who have not been with us on this journey, we are, we are in the story of Paul. Paul the Apostle who wrote a lot of the New Testament. And he is in the last part of his life. He's in custody of the Romans. And he will stay in the custody of the Romans. But he is not in Rome yet. He's in a little, he's in a city called Caesarea. I bet you can see the word Caesar in Caesarea. It's named after Caesar, Roman capital of the region. And the Roman governor is named Festus. And the Roman governor <clears throat> has talked to Paul, and Paul's appealed to Caesar. He said, I want my case to go to Caesar. <clears throat> but Festus has a problem. Festus doesn't know what to charge Paul with, because when he talked to Paul, it didn't seem like he was guilty of anything. But Paul's appealed to Caesar, so to Caesar he has to go. And he's asked the opinion of King Agrippa. King Agrippa is a Hebrew. Well, he is. His ancestors weren't. But someone became Jewish along the way. Although he's not a very popular Hebrew, he's not a very good practicing Hebrew, but he is a Hebrew. King of the Jews, according to Rome. And so, Governor Felix has asked King Agrippa to listen to Paul's case to help him figure out what charge to send to Rome with Paul. So that when he shows up to Caesar, he's not like, Caesar doesn't go, why did you send me this guy? I don't know. Because that would be embarrassing. So he's got to have a charge. So he's got to figure out what the charge is. And that's what's happening. I am going to tell the story as usual, but I'm going to spend a little less time on the story this time than usual, and a little bit more on some questions. But let's first read the chapter. Acts chapter 26, starting with verse 1. And Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all these things in which I am accused by the by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all the customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time previously, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people that God raises the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. 
And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they, when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them, often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged with them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. And while thus engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things that you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Consequently, King Agrippa, I did, did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the regions of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. And so, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying to both small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets of Moses said was going to take place that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be first a proclamation, I'm sorry, to be the first to proclaim light to both the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And was Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. But I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of those things escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that whatever, whether in a short or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I, except for these chains. And the king arose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had drawn aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. This is the third time we hear the story of Paul's conversion in Acts. Three times. That's almost as many times as we get the story of Christ's death and resurrection. Just uh, an interesting point. Um, there have been criticisms against the Bible that because all three stories are slightly different, that it proves that the Bible is inaccurate or that it is inconsistent. If you ever hear this argument, I'd like to remind you of something pretty important. Um, none of them actually contradict each other. If they did, that would actually be an interesting argument. Uh, I am sure that you have told the same story to different people in different circumstances. And when you told the same story to different people in different circumstances, you may have included details once that you did not include later, or expanded on one section that you did not expand before, based on who you were talking to. This did not make you a liar. It simply meant that based on who you were talking to, you brought out different things. Which is exactly the case with the different versions of this story that we hear. There are different audiences, and there are slightly different things that get brought out. 
but they're always complementary or what we would say supplementary. They add details, but they don't contradict details. There are some details in this story, in this particular version, that are specific. One that we're going to get to later is in verse 14. I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect. This is the only version of the story in which Paul says that the voice that spoke to him spoke to him in Hebrew. This is going to become an important thing we talk about in just a little bit. But the other versions don't specify that. I already talked about how who Agrippa was. He's the king of the Jews. Verse 2. <clears throat> Notice, remember the sermon, for the, some of you may have been here for the sermon about Paul's cheerful defense. And you remember that one. And now we hear he's defending himself again against unjustified charges. And it says that he is what? Fortunate. Once again, an extremely impossibly good attitude while being treated extremely unfairly. <clears throat> so here's your one sentence sermon on that topic. God expects us to react with a good attitude no matter how badly we're being treated. Another note, in verse 3, it says that Agrippa was familiar with the customs and questions among the Jews. Uh, last week we talked about this fact that Agrippa was actually living with his sister, not exactly following the law. But he was familiar with the Jewish customs. It just If you ever want to do an interesting comparison... It would appear that Paul's arguments were significantly different based on his audience. When he was in front of the mob in Jerusalem, <clears throat> what he said to them is very similar, very, very close to what he says to Agrippa. So when he was speaking to an audience that knew about the customs of the Jews, he said one set of things. But when he was talking with Romans who knew nothing, he left a lot of stuff out. And so we see that his defense to Festus and Felix had one kind of feel to it, but when he was talking to Jews, it had a completely different feel. And so we're back to the same, almost exact same kind of message that he was giving the mob in Jerusalem. <clears throat> I'm going to skip to verse 24. Sorry. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. So interestingly, Paul gets interrupted again at the same point in his talk. So in Acts 22, 21, he was, he was preaching to the crowd, and just as he got to the part where God sent him to the Gentiles, and the crowd interrupted him with, a, with loud, violent anger, and he had to stop. And then when we get to Acts 26, 23, what does it say? He was talking about how he should be the first to proclaim light to both the Jewish people and to the Gentiles, and while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus interrupts him. It says, while Paul was saying this, while he was still speaking, Festus interrupts. It's interesting to me that in both of his speeches, he was cruising along, he had more to say, and in both times he got interrupted. I don't know why that is. I just thought I'd point out that it was interesting to me. And it seemed like somewhat in the same spot of what he had to say. As we move on to 27 to 29, King Agrippa says one of the most, well, he says a phrase that's been preached about thousands and thousands of times. <clears throat> Paul says, King Agrippa, if you believe in the prophets, I know you do. By the way, Paul, this, this is the setup. Paul is ready <clears throat> to give a defense from the prophets, which he has done over and over in synagogue after synagogue after synagogue. This is his opening phrase. Do you believe in the prophets? And when they say yes, he would he would flip that sucker open and he would go for it. And he would start showing from the prophets why Jesus was the Messiah. All he needed was a yes. This could have gone on for a very long time. He is using his opening phrase. He is ready to talk to Agrippa. He's ready to convince Agrippa that he should be a Christian. That's the whole point. And so here's his opening line. Do you believe in the prophets? I know you do. Give me that yes and we will take off. 
And the Gripper doesn't reply with that answer. The Gripper replies with Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. Now just a little note here, that is actually a fairly thorny phrase to translate properly. It could mean exactly that, but it could also mean something more like, in such a short time, do you expect me to become a Christian? It could mean either one of those or somewhere in the between. But either way, Paul is cut to the chase in a way that King Agrippa cannot ignore. And he has once again used a terrible situation to find a way to witness to the person who's accusing him. He did it with Felix. He's doing it again with Agrippa. Paul will not lose any opportunity to share Christ. He doesn't ever lose an opportunity to share Christ. He manages in every situation he's in, which should be an example to us. But my sermon this morning isn't actually on that passage, even though it's a very popular one. My sermon is going to go back a little bit. And then as we go into 31 and 32, once again, Paul is determined to be innocent. This man is not doing anything worthy of death. But to Caesar, he was still going to have to go. Interestingly, this hearing was to determine what charge Paul would be sent with. That question is not answered in Acts. In fact, I have looked through the Bible to some extent. I have used some other tools. I have not found in the Bible a reference to what Paul was ever actually charged with when he was sent to Rome. But that was, that's what was supposed to be determined here, is what charge are we sending him with? We never get that answer. That's interesting. But what I'd like to go back to now is 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15. I have spoken on this before. I have said some of the things I'm going to say today before, but it is extremely important and it's worth saying again, so if you remember some of it, that's okay. So let's look at this incident where God appears to Saul. By the way, if you were confused about the Saul thing, Paul's name was Saul, which is a Jewish name, and when he went to go work with the Gentiles, he changed his name into Paul, which is a Greek name, and so if you're confused about it, he said Paul once and Saul the other time, that's what's happening. So here's what happens. Verse 14. And when we had all fallen, oh no, 13, at midday, so let's get this idea. It's in the middle of the day, it's noon. Sun is bright at noon. I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me, and when we had all fallen to the ground. So let's think about that. I've seen some bright lights before. I don't ever recall one that made me fall over. Like, you might do this, or turn around. But falling down to the ground doesn't seem to be a normal reaction to light. Even if it was the pitch black middle of the night and the brightest light ever shown on my face, I'm not sure falling down would be the reaction. But somehow these guys have made it to the, to the earth. They're not standing anymore. And then he hears a voice saying in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to keep kick against the goal, goats? And I said, who art thou, Lord? I'm going to make a little bit of assumption, but it, I don't think it's a huge one. Here's the assumption. The voice spoke in Hebrew. Paul spoke Hebrew. I'm going to assume that his response was also in Hebrew. Is it, do you think that's a big stretch? The voice said in Hebrew, Paul responded in Hebrew. I think that's a pretty normal, not, not out of the world assumption to make. If that's true though, here's what happens. It's something like this. We have a Hebrew conversation 
that Paul is verbally translating into Greek, which is then written in Greek and then later translated to English. If that sounds complicated, you're right. That is a lot of steps. There's a lot of steps between the word in my Bible and the words that were spoken at the time. There's a lot of steps in there. One of the steps is this. Have you ever noticed in the Old Testament, some of you don't know well enough, some of you definitely do, there's a word Lord with a capital L and then the capital O and a capital R and a capital D in, little, in the Old Testament. Have you ever seen that? that that's that's um, a translator's device to try to give us a sense of what word that represents. It is more important than just sir or mister, but that it's more like Elohim or Adonai, one of those words for God. That word doesn't exist in Greek at all. In fact, there's a whole lot of Hebrew words that don't exist in Greek at all. They don't even exist. The word that Paul uses, Lord, who are you, Lord, could mean about a dozen different Hebrew words. So how do we know which one he meant? We, we, get, we know what he said in Greek, Lord. What we really don't know is which of the 12 Hebrew words that that could represent that it actually was. So I'm going to give you some of the options of what, of what this word has been used to mean in the Bible. On one end of the spectrum, this word that Lord, that Paul used, could mean Adonai or Elohim. And if you know anything, some of you will know, those are names for God. And some of you will go, oh, wow, those are, I've never heard those words before, so you're just going to have to believe me. Those are Old Testament names for God. Elohim and Adonai are, are Jewish names for God. So if he used Lord and he meant one of those two, that had a very specific meaning. Of course, on the whole other end of the, the spectrum, the word Lord that he used could mean sir or hey, mister. That's a pretty broad difference between, hey, mister, and God. And then I'm not going to explain to you all the different nuances of all 12 stuff in between. I'm not going to do that. So here's your big chance. You, this morning, get to play Bible translator. You're going to get to do this. So how do we translate the Bible when we have more than one option? What we do is we take all the possible meanings it could be, we read the context, and we see what came before, what after, and we say which of the, all the meanings best fits the circumstances. And so that's how real translators really translate Greek and Hebrew into English, because they have to make those decisions all the time. So here you go. Our circumstance is there's a light brighter than the sun a presence so strong it knocks everyone to the ground and a voice out of nowhere speaks. When Paul addresses that phenomenon, are we going to say that he meant, hey mister, or are we going to say that he was addressing God? Which do you think makes more sense? I'm going to go with God. You don't have to agree with me. I'm going there. I'm going with, he said... Who are you, God? And this becomes a very, very, very interesting question. In fact, it becomes a question that almost every person asks at some time in their life. Who are you, God? Who are you, God? I've asked that question. I've asked that question when it was confusing and difficult and I felt lost and I felt unsettled and I felt unsteady and I was, wait a minute, that sounds exactly where Paul's at right now. Totally confused, totally off center, totally out of balance. If that's what he meant, that becomes a very interesting question. If you believe that there is a God, then this question of who is God is one of the most important questions of your entire life. 
Who is he, she, it, them? What are they like? What are their standards? What do they think? What do they want? If there's a being so powerful that created the entire universe and is able to decide what is right and wrong, then it seems to be pretty important to figure out what that being is like. Who are they? That has got to be an absolutely essential question. Who is God? Both the question and the answer have already played a big part in the story of the Bible already. Let's go back to Exodus, if you don't mind. Exodus chapter 3. There's another man who's encountering God. His name is Moses. Exodus 3, starting in verse 13, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Paraphrase. Who are you, God? Who are you? What shall I tell them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This answer becomes a fundamental truth that defines God as completely different than all other gods in the time frame. The Egyptian gods weren't I am. The Egyptian gods had causes, they, there were things that happened and then, the God came, and then they could die and they had relationships and they made mistakes and there were limits to their power. The Babylonian gods were the same way. The, the, whoever gods, all the gods of the world around them were these limited, more, better, more than people but less than omnipotent things. And then God says, I'm going to explain you to you who I am. I am. I am self-sufficient. I'm without beginning. I'm without end. I'm all-powerful. I am all-knowing. And I am not dependent on anyone, nor am I subject to anyone else's opinions. Right is what I say it is. Wrong is what I say it is. I am God. I am. And this conversation between God and Moses launches a nation. And the foundation is this clear and powerful answer to the question of who is God? Look at some of the details that are here. God appears in an undeniably miraculous way. And there's light from a fire. There is an audible voice. There's a calling of a leader to transition the people of God, in this case, from a family to a nation. There's a leader who is confused by his selection. There is a question of who God is, and the answer becomes a fundamental truth that defines God in a very important way. That's what happens in the story of Moses. Now, we have Jesus comes along. Here's some of the things that Jesus says about himself. John 3, 6, 35. I am the bread of life. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. John 10, 9. I am the gate. John 11, 25 and 26. I am the the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Look, if I say something like, I am a carpenter, which I'm not, that doesn't spook anybody into thinking that I'm somehow claiming to be God. I'm not taking that little I am bit and turning it into something else. But when I say statements like, I am the resurrection and the life, we are treading on something different of what I'm claiming that I am part meant. See, the, the I am thing now starts to tread upon your claiming, you're claiming to be I am. You're uh, taking on the identity of God himself. When you say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that is a God statement. That is, I am, I am. This was the claims of Christ. 
And when we realize that that is what Christ used, and we think about the context of Moses, and then we hear Paul say, who are you, God? Look at what Jesus says in return. I am Jesus. It's both there. Who are you, God? I am. You already knew that. We told Moses that. I told Moses that. I told Moses that I, I am. Jesus. Also, God. Just like with Moses, God appears in an undeniably miraculous way. There is light. There is an audible voice. There is a calling for a leader who is somewhat confused to transition the people of God this time from a Jewish nation into a church that includes Gentiles. And by the way, that was the exact specific purpose that we learned in the book of Ephesians that Paul was given the task to do. He was to bring the Gentiles, us, people who are not Jewish, into the promise of God. And so just as much as the burning bush was a moment in which Moses was called to a very specific thing that transformed everything. Paul was transformed by this moment with God, this calling, this light that transformed everything. There's a reason why we get this story three times. We get this story three times because this is a, this is a bedrock moment of the, of the church. It's a very important moment of the calling Paul what it means. I am Jesus. But here's the thing with, with, with Jesus being added. Never before has God been accessible like this. Jesus, Jesus ate with them and joked with them and slept and, and gave them hugs. You see, by, by I am becoming Jesus, even though Paul hadn't personally experienced those things, people had, the disciples had, real people had encountered a real person, and, and pardon the pun, I am got fleshed out. Okay, some of you are laughing. So, this, this who God was cosmically suddenly became who God was in humanity. It's why we read the Gospels and we, and we pour through it and we look for every little piece that we can. Because why? Because we want to know who God is. And Jesus gives us all these amazing life details of who God is. How does he react? How does he deal with people? What is his attitude towards folks? What is his attitude towards sin? What is his attitude towards pain? What is his attitude towards doubt? How does he deal with his... How do we know God through Jesus? And because we have the stories of what Jesus did, God is illuminated in a whole new way. And so we pour through the Gospels for this rich understanding of who is God, because now it isn't just God I am, which is awesome. It is God I am Jesus. And the richness of what is available to us to understand who our God is explodes. Nothing of Jesus' character contradicts what we know of the I am God. God is I am and God is Jesus. I'm going to change topic slightly for a moment, so hang on with me, but I'm going to change topic. Does it matter if we define God in the exact same way as each other? Does it matter? I have a Buddhist friend that is all about everybody is on the same journey. We all are on the same journey. We're all going to the same place. It's all spokes to the center. It does not matter which one you think. I have, I have two friends named Ben. Ben Dixon and Galara Ben. Ben Oath, Monster Truck Ben Oath. For those of you who don't know, I'm now pronouncing it from the pulpit. Monster Truck Ben 
It's like, no. They have the same name. They're different people. If someone said, go to Ben's house, he'll meet you there and lend you a drill, and I picked the wrong Ben, let me tell you what happens. I go to the house, no one's there, and I don't get a drill. Does it, right? Just because they have the same name doesn't mean they're the same person. And if I go to the wrong house and I'm expecting the wrong thing, I don't get what it is I expected to get. Not only that, it only takes one characteristic different to make someone a different person. Just one. Suppose that the police are chasing a criminal named Joe Brown. They're looking for Joe Brown. They find a guy named Joe Brown. They say, we're looking for a man who's 203 centimeters tall. He's 203 centimeters tall. We're looking for a man who's 100 kilograms. He's 100 kilograms. We're looking for a man with brown hair. He has brown hair. We're looking for a man who enjoys fishing. He's got fishing stuff all over his house. Ah, but the witness specifically said that the Joe Brown they're looking for was missing a finger. And this Joe Brown has all 10. Can they bring him in because he met 9 out of 10? No. He either fits all the characteristics or he doesn't. We cannot define someone and say, well, it's close enough. When it comes to identity of who we are, you either all of the things you're supposed to be or you are not. It is not sufficient for it to be close. Ish. Kind of. A person is a person based on all of their characteristics. And so if we're defining God in a, and a key characteristic is missing or changed, then guess what? It's not the same God anymore. It is a different God. Just as much as it would be a different Joe that the cops were looking for. Now take notice, I'm not talking about how we feel. Two people, different people might feel differently about Joe, that's okay. I like Joe, you might hate Joe. That's fine. It doesn't take, change Joe for me every person. Different people have different feelings about God. That doesn't change his identity. That we're good with that. We're talking about characteristics. Here's a sample question. For instance, is the God of the Bible and the God of the Muslims the same God? I've been told that they are. I disagree. Is it Short example, um, I watched a video in my religions course, there was an ex-American Christian explaining why he became a Muslim. Um, and here was one of his main points, it was about Noah. He said, the Noah of the Bible gets drunk in Genesis 9.21. <coughs> then this young man said that God would never use a sinful man to do his work, therefore the Bible is wrong and needs to be corrected. You see, in the Muslim belief, God doesn't forgive. There's no grace. You either toe the line when you're perfect or you get judged. That's it. And so the fact that our Old Testament, nearly, every, with a few exceptions, nearly every single character has their mistakes recorded. Almost all of them. Therefore, the Muslims look at that and say, that is an error, that is wrong. But guess what it illuminates? That their God is different than ours, because it shows that even in the Old Testament, we think of, uh, in the Old Testament, God was mean and mighty and judgmental. Wait, 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 wait. From the beginning, God had used broken, human people who made mistakes, and he redeemed them, and he fixed them, and he shed grace on them. That's always been God's mode from the very beginning. That's why we have their mistakes listed, so we can see God's grace. It isn't, by the way, that he doesn't deal with their mistakes, or that he just poo-poos their mistakes and says it's okay that you sin. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about he doesn't flush people down the toilet because they made a mistake. He reaches in and fixes it. That's always been who God is. If that's my God and the Muslim God would never do that, then it's not the same God. Because that is an extremely important characteristic. That is a, that is a key difference. And that difference completely changes how I react to what I believe God is. 
And so the Muslims have a standard of works. Do this, do this, do this. And if you do it good enough, maybe you'll be perfect enough and you'll be blessed. And we say, you can't ever be perfect enough. God wants to shed his grace on you. Will you accept that grace and allow him to start to change you into the person he wants you to be? Those are vastly different perspectives. It is not the same God. But here's maybe the more intimate question. If I were to ask you, who is God? What would your answer be? For Paul, just in these verses, we get so much. Just in these verses here, going back to Acts. Paul said, who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus Christ, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you. Already he is I am. Already he is Jesus. Already he is one who gives purpose. I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister. He is already a God who appoints and empowers. And a witness, not only to these things which you have seen, but also the things that you will, I will appear to you. He is a God who communicates personally to people. Verse 17, delivered you from the Jewish people. He is a deliverer from our danger. To whom I am ascending you. He is a God with purpose and plan for who we are and what we are to accomplish. To open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light. He is a saving God who saves people from the dominion of Satan and says to God. He's a saving God. In order that they may receive forgiveness, he is a forgiving God of sins and an inheritance. He is a God that provides an eternal inheritance forever among those who have been sanctified. He is a sanctifying, purifying God by faith in me. There is a ton of information about who God is to Paul. And right there, this is who God is to me. If you're wrestling with understanding the truth, you're just starting in your faith, there's really hardly a better question to start with than who is God. If you're moving into this and trying to understand, there's so much richness in the answer to the question, who is God? For those of you who have been a Christian a long time, do we still remember who God is supposed to be? Has God become something you try? An option? Oh man, I've tried everything. I mean, I really gave it my best shot. Oh hey, yeah, we can pray for it. Yeah, we can pray about it. Like an afterthought. When it comes to temptation, do you ask for God's help after you failed and failed and failed and failed and failed, or do you go to Him first? Have you let become your let your God become little, uncaring, disinterested, boring, outdated, a vicious dictator, a permissive grandparent, a forgiveness dispenser? Oh, there's a lot of us that treat God just. Oh, God, I need forgiveness again. I'm going to push the, the forgiveness button, okay? All right, I got my confession done. I'm forgiven. A source of entertainment? An insurance policy. Sure, I'm glad I walked the all and I don't have to go to hell. Well, that's done. Check that off my list. And a theological concept, a moral perspective, a list of rules, a social habit. Who is your God really? The answer to this question will shape your life. Over and above whether you claim the title of Christian, whether or not you call yourself a Christian will shape your life what, much, much less than who your God actually is every day. 
That, the answer to that question will change the decisions you make, where you go, how you talk, all kinds of things, over and above whether or not there's this label of Christian by your name. Now here's a hard question. If our definition of who God really is has always been missing a fundamental of his character, and was our faith ever in the real God or was our faith in a counterfeit? If you've lived a life in which you've never felt the kind of things that Paul wrote about, he wrote about all this great stuff that God's supposed to do in our life, and that he did in Paul's life, like direction and protection and guidance and forgiveness and an understanding of this inheritance that we have and an empowerment if that has never described you ever, then maybe you need to ask yourself a hard question. Has my definition of who God really is been so wrong that my faith has never been in the real God at all? It is never too late to discover that Jesus wants a different relationship with us than we've had with him before. It is never too late to say in your heart, I got this wrong, and I need to get it right. Maybe in such a short time as this, you could be persuaded to become a Christian. Like Peter Griffin said. I don't want to stand up here trying to convince you that you don't have something that you do have. That's not my point. My purpose in being up here is to say, we've got to understand who God is. And when we don't understand who God is, it can cause significant problems. In fact, the problem can be so significant that our faith was never in the God who is in the first place. And that is a catastrophically bad problem. But it's a fixable problem. There's the joy. There's the, there's the peace. There's the comfort. Wherever you're at, whatever needs to be done from here, it can, we can move. We can do this. We can put God in the place of who he is. We can acknowledge the I am of God and acknowledge the Jesus Christ of God and the Holy Spirit of God and all of these things of God. And we can acknowledge all those things for what they really are. We can right the second say, that's what my faith is in. And I know that you're not just a forgiveness dispenser. And I know you're not a last resort. And I know you're not an addendum to my life. And I know you're not some sort of social club. You are God. And I get that. And right this second, God, I put my faith in understanding who you are, that you are holy, perfect, righteous, gracious, saving God. That's the good news. That's always been the good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, could you show us who you are? Would you make us humble enough that no matter where we are in our faith, that we would go to you and say you're fresh and anew. Who are you, God? Show me, God, who you are. Help me to read the scripture with an eye to understanding who you are and what you value and what you care about and what you do. Take me to your word and take me to prayer and take me to this place where your Holy Spirit communicates to me. I want to understand you. I want to know you, God. Who are you? Lord, would we never give up on the quest to know you better than we did yesterday? And we acknowledge, Lord, that you are infinite and we will never run out of more of you to discover. That's one of the amazing joys of thinking about heaven. God, you will never, ever be something I outgrow. 
There will always be more. Lord, we just pray. I pray right now. I pray diligently. I pray fervently. I pray from the depths of everything I have that the people in this room, in this town, in this nation would come to know you for exactly the person you are, not a counterfeit, but the real you. Jesus, let me pray.